Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming along uh, this evening to the University of Otago um, Winter Lecture Series. Tonight's lecture is by Professor Harry Gilford. Um, Professor Gilford is a principal investigator in the Cancer Genetics Laboratory with the University of Otago. Uh, and he's also a director of research of Pacific Edge Biotechnology Limited. Um, he completed his MSc at Otago in 1983 and his PhD at Cambridge University in 1989. His research interests include the genetics of inherited cancers, in particular gastric cancer, and the application of gene expression analysis to the diagnosis and management of cancer. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, a pleasure to, to be here. The um, talk today is uh, really a very general one, and so we'll be happy to, you know, you know, have a discussion at the end if you have lots of questions. But um, I really want to go through um, the basic understanding of what, of what cancer is, cancer disease, and then a little bit on um, how we see treatment um, developing in the coming years, um, you know, largely built around our knowledge of how um, the the disease develops through um, emerging mutations in the, in the, uh, the DNA. So, the problem with cancer is a very primitive and fundamental disease. And by that, I mean it is everywhere. So, words get cancer. So, you can probably see uh, that this is a little sound word called skeleton. Women get cancer. Flies get cancer. So, here's a, a brain tumor on, on a fruit fly. Fish get cancer. This is a melanoma on a fish called zebrafish. Tasmanians get cancer. And this, this is an, uh, an unusual cancer um, which is caused by a bite from an infected um, animal which leads to this um, aggressive um, uh, neck tumour which is threatening the species and uh, so much so, so that um, it may be that the population in the New Zealand Zoo may be the last population there are of the Tasmanian devil before terribly long. But anyway, they get cancer. It's also a very old disease. Dinosaurs used to get cancer. We know that from the fossil record. But this is a, a shot of a Brontosaurus. I think I'm not sure is it an A or a rib or a tail bone, but it's a, it's a tumour which is developed on a Brontosaurus bone. Um, and it was probably a, 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 a metastasis from a, 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 a tumour inside one of its organs. And so that's from 150 million years ago. Recent um, analysis of a mummy from Egypt from 50 BC shown That mummy um, or that uh, had prostate cancer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming along uh, this evening to the University of Otago um, Winter Lecture Series. Tonight's lecture is by Professor Perry Guilford. Um, Professor Guilford is a principal investigator in the Cancer Genetics Laboratory with the University of Otago. Uh, and he's also a director of research of Pacific Edge Biotechnology Limited. Um, he completed his MSc at Otago in 1983 and his PhD at Cambridge University in 1989. His research interests include the genetics of inherited cancers, in particular gastric cancer, and the application of gene expression analysis to the diagnosis and management of cancer. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, a pleasure to, to be here. The um, talk today is uh, really a very general one, so we'll be happy to discussion at the end if you have lots of questions, but um, I really want to go through um, the basic understanding of what, what cancer is as a disease and then a little bit on um, how we see treatment 
um, developing in the coming years um, you know, and our knowledge of how um, the, the disease develops through um, emerging mutations in the, in the, uh, the DNA. So the real problem is that cancer is a very primitive and fundamental disease. And by that, I mean it is everywhere. So worms get cancer. So you probably see up there a little round worm called sea lions. Worms get cancer. Flies get cancer. So here's a, a, um, a brain tumour on, on a, a fruit fly. Fish get cancer. This is a, a melanoma on a little fish called a zebra fish. Tas even Tasmanian devils get cancer. This, this is an, uh, an unusual cancer um, which is caused by a bite from an infected um, animal which leads to this um, you know, really aggressive um, head and neck tumor, which is actually threatening the species. So um, it may be that the population in New Zealand zoos may be the last populations there are of the Tasmanian devil they get cancer. It's also a very old disease. Dinosaurs used to get cancer. We know that from the fossil records. So this is a shell of a brontosaurus. I'm not sure if that's a rib or a tail bone, but it's a, it's a tumor which is developed on a brontosaurus bone. Um, and it was probably a, a, a metastasis from a, 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 a tumor inside one of its organs. So that's from 150 million years ago. Um, analysis of a mummy from Egypt from 250 BC shown that that mummy um, uh, had prostate cancer. So many years ago, prostate cancer was a, a problem as well. Indigenous Peruvians, this came from the high, the high, dry, arid region of, of uh, Peru, and this is a genuine bone cancer from 1150 AD. From 1550 AD. Did the sculpture called and this one here, the left breast, you can probably make out the, the um, development of a large tumor. And it's the range of the sculpture um, to express the pain and suffering that woman was going through because of her breast cancer. So you can see it's a, an old disease and it's a fundamental disease. It's not a disease of humans, it's not a disease of modern times, it's a disease. And it's caused by genetic damage. There's damage to the DNA sequence buried inside all the cells. It's, it's, it's damaged to genes in particular which are involved in the regulation of cell growth, cell survival, and cell migration. When these mutations occur in the DNA sequence, you get um, a rapid selection of cells um, which have an, a certain acquired advantage. There's a chance of the ability to survive um, more. Uh, readily than the neighbouring normal cells. So what you're really seeing is evolution in, um, in action in a very shortened time frame. Uh, new variants of genes for by the environment. So it's a, a very, very powerful disease. There are probably about five main causes of cancer. Of which causes cancer. The first one is so you know, bad nuns get lung cancer. I guess good nuns get lung cancer as well, but certainly bad lung nuns who smoke a lot get lung cancer. So lifestyle is very important when we know such as smoking. Risk occupations can cause genetic damage and lead to cancer as well. Um, this photograph is of a, a chimney sweep, and, and um, this uh, occupation, first occupation described, um, which was associated with a um, high rate of cancer. And in fact, these um, poor little chimney sweeps used to get a very high rate of cancer of the scrotum. And you can kind of figure out why, um, why it was cancer of the scrotum. They get incredible exposure to carcinogens. Um, in their nether regions, and hence that uh, disease in the part of their body. This is an link that occupation with the onset of cancer. 
the environment can cause genetic damage for the Tasmanian people, so these these isolation, then you'll be uh, you'll have a hit which will take you towards um, developing a cancer. So what do these mutations do? <coughs> Normal cells in a body live a very, very controlled life. They have they are given very defined jobs or functions. They must do something like they might, for example, they might produce acid in the stomach. They might produce a mucin in the colon. They might um, release insulin. They might be involved in holding cells together in a certain way. Very specialised functions. And the general idea for a cell and normal tissue is to perform the specialist function and then, before too long, die. So, a, a, a short life with a specialised function. In cancer that regulation and that specialization is lost. So cells no longer um, are truly specialized. They, they kind of give up the idea of trying to be a stomach, a stomach cell or a or colon cell or a muscle cell. They just become cells which become um, self-governing and, and they forget about the context that they're in. So there's no more contribution to what we'd call the greater good. They don't try and be, behave as part of a bigger tissue. They just start to act. Um, really for their own um, survival benefit. But, and the way they do this is by, is by acquiring capabilities which, are normally, which normally only occur in specialist settings. And I'll explain that in the slide here. So these acquired abilities a cancer, a cancer cell gets are things like they can migrate like cells in a developing embryo or in a healing wound. So for example, if you get a, a cut in your arm the cells on the edge of that wound will have to migrate across that wound to heal. So cancer cell from okay. yeah, yeah, remember that. Yeah. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming along uh, this evening to the University of Otago um, Winter Lecture Series. Tonight's lecture is by Professor Harry Guilford. Um, Professor Guilford is a principal investigator in the Cancer Genetics Laboratory with the University of Otago. Uh, and he's also Director of Research of Pacific Edge Biotechnology Limited. Um, he completed his MSc at Otago in 1983 and his PhD at Cambridge University in 1989. His research interests include the genetics of inherited cancers, in particular gastric cancer, and the application of gene expression analysis to the diagnosis and management of cancer. Professor Guilford. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, a pleasure to, to be here. The, um, the talk today is uh, really a very general one and so we'll be happy to you know, um, have a discussion at the end if you have lots of questions, but um, I really want to go through um, the basic understanding of, of what cancer is as a disease and then a little bit on um, how we see treatment um, developing in the coming years, um, you know, largely built around our knowledge of how um, the, the disease develops through um, emerging mutations in the, in the, uh, the DNA. So the real problem is that cancer is a very primitive and fundamental disease. And by that, I mean it is everywhere. So worms get cancer. So you can probably see up there, this is a little round worm called C. elegans. Worms get cancer. Flies get cancer. So here's a, a, um, a brain tumour on, on a, a fruit fly. Fish get cancer. This is a, a melanoma on a little fish called a zebrafish. Tas even Tasmanian devils get cancer. Now this, this is an, uh, an unusual cancer um, which is caused by a bite from an infected um, animal which leads to this um, you know, really aggressive um, uh, head and neck tumour which is actually threatening the species and so, uh, so much so, so that um, it may be that the population in New Zealand zoos may be the last populations there are of the Tasmanian devil before terribly long. But anyway, they get cancer. 
It's also a very old disease. Dinosaurs used to get cancer. And we know that from the fossil record. So this is a, a shot of a, a brontosaurus. I think I'm not sure if it's a, a, a rib or a tailbone, but it's a, it's a tumour which has developed on a brontosaurus bone. Um, and it was probably a, 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 a metastasis from a, 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 a tumour inside one of its organs. And so that's from 150 million years ago. Recent um, analysis of a mummy from Egypt from 250 BC shown that that mummy um, uh, had prostate cancer. So many, many years ago, prostate cancer was a, a problem as well. Indigenous per uh, Peruvians, so this is taken from the kind of a high, the high, dry, arid region of, of uh, Peru, and this is a genuine bone cancer from 1150 AD. From 1550 AD, um, Michelangelo did the sculpture called Night, and this woman here, her left breast, you can probably make out the, the um, development of a fairly large tumour there, and it's believed that um, Michelangelo actually did this, this sculpture um, to express the pain and suffering that this woman was going through because of her breast cancer. So you can see it's a, an old disease and it's a fundamental disease. It's not a disease of humans, it's not a disease of modern times, it's a disease which has always been with us and always will be with us. And it's caused by genetic damage, that is changes to the DNA sequence occurring inside all of our cells. And it's, it's, it's damaged the genes in particular which are involved in the regulation of cell growth, cell survival, and cell migration. When these mutations occur in the DNA sequence, you get um, a rapid selection of cells um, which have an, a certain acquired advantage, that is a chance, the ability to survive um, more uh, readily than the neighboring normal cells. So what you're really seeing is evolution in, um, in action in a very shortened time frame whereby DNA damage occurs giving new variants of, of genes which are selected for by the environment. So it's a, a very basic and very powerful disease. There are probably about five main causes of cancer, or of genetic, the genetic damage which causes cancer. The first one is lifestyle. So you know, bad nuns get lung cancer. I, mean, I guess good nuns might get lung cancer as well, but certainly bad lung, nuns who smoke a lot get lung cancer. So lifestyle is very important. We know, we know, you know some of the risk factors such as smoking. Risk occupations can cause genetic damage and lead to cancer as well. Um, this photograph is of a, a chimney sweep and, and um, this uh, occupation was the first occupation described um, which was associated with um, a high rate of cancer. And in fact, these um, poor little chimney sweeps used to get a very high rate of cancer of the scrotum. And you can kind of figure out why, um, why it was cancer of the scrotum. They get an incredible exposure to carcinogens um, in their nether regions, and hence that dis uh, disease in that part of their body. But this was described in, in the 1800s by a guy called Professor Potts, um, who was the first person to link that occupation with the onset of cancer. The environment can cause genetic damage. So I mentioned before the uh, Tasmanian devil. So these, these um, uh, little beasts have a, a cancer which is remarkably, in, a remarkable that it is infectious. So these, de uh, these devils are all very, very similar. And so infectious or, or cancerous cells from one Tasmanian devil can be passed on through a bite to another Tasmanian devil, and then the, the, the tumour will develop in the other Tasmanian devil as well. We all know about the risks of radiation, and we also know about the risks of, of many different viral infections as well. So examples there, of course, are cervical cancer. And increasingly, awareness that um, the same virus, papillomavirus, is causing um, head and neck cancers as well. You can inherit faulty genes, which can lead to a very high rate of cancer. So, for example, Napoleon, up there, uh, on, on your uh, top left, was from a family who had inherited stomach cancer, as was the family at the, in the, at the bottom in the middle there. That's the uh, member of the McLeod, McLeod Fauna from Mount Maunganui who have an incredible history of stomach cancer over many, many generations. 
Pope John the Twenty Third in the Middle East also had came from a, a, a long history of, of, of um, family members with inherited stomach cancer as well. And um, Angela Jolie, of course, you all would have heard of her story of being from a family with a mutation which leads to a very high rate of breast and ovarian cancer. So you can inherit genes which give you a high rate of this disease. The fifth reason, and probably the most important reason, and probably the most disturbing reason, is bad luck. We don't live in the Garden of Eden. We don't live in a state of perfect paradise, or most of us don't. Um, but um, bad luck occurs and leads to cancer. So whenever a cell divides, and there are billions of cells in the body, it must copy its entire genome and do it almost perfectly every single time. So that means the 3.3 billion letters of DNA code must be copied every time a cell divides. And so cells, for example, in the stomach um, will divide every three to five days. So that's an incredible amount of information which must be copied and copied correctly every few days. And when mistakes occur, those, those mistakes occur in genes which are important for um, cell survival or migration or proliferation, then you'll, be, uh, you'll have a hit which will take you towards um, developing a cancer. So what do these mutations do? <clears throat> Normal cells in a body live a very, very controlled life. They, have, they are given very defined jobs or functions. They must do something like, they might, for example, they might produce acid in the stomach, they might produce a mucin in the colon, they might um, release insulin, they might be involved in holding cells together in a certain way. Very specialised functions. And the general idea for a cell in normal tissue is to perform the specialist function and then, before too long, die. So a, a, a short life with a specialised function. In cancer, that regulation and that specialization is lost. So cells no longer um, are truly specialized. They, they kind of give up the idea of trying to be a stomach, a stomach cell or a or colon cell or a muscle cell. They just become cells which become um, self-governing and, and they forget about the context that they're in. So there's no more contribution to what we'd call the greater good. They don't try and be, behave as part of a bigger tissue. They just start to act um, really for their own um, survival benefit. But, and the way they do this is by, is by acquiring capabilities which, are normally, which normally only occur in specialist settings. And I'll explain that in the slide here. So these acquired abilities a cancer, a cancer cell gets are things like they can migrate like cells in a developing embryo or in a healing wound. So for example, if you get a, a cut in your arm the cells on the edge of that wound will have to migrate across that wound to heal it. So cancer cells acquire the ability to migrate and move. So it's an ability which is already present, already part of a normal human, of a normal tissue, but the cancer cell will grab that ability and use it for its own benefit. Cancer cells get the ability to move in and out of blood vessels like an immune cell does. They can coax blood vessels to grow into them like uh, new tissues often do. They can decrease their reliance on oxygen, like um, tissues which have you know, low oxygen levels do, like um, you know, muscle under extreme stress. They can make growth factors which are normally made them by other cells. They can lengthen their telomeres so that they um, increase their survival time, just like stem cells do. They can learn to ignore inhibitory signals from cells around them. They can re recruit inflammatory cells to provide growth factors. They can ignore death signals. They can pump out drugs like kidney cells do. And they can resist radiation, again, like stem cells do. They can even do things like hide from the immune system, like many cells in the body do, particularly in the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract. So what we see here is a cancer cell has acquired all these abilities. None of them are new. They have not come out of space. They have not come from anywhere strange. They are abilities or capabilities that, is, that are held by different cells or different tissues in normal people. So the, the disease is really, it's really like um, playing uh, euchre against where your opponent has every single card in the, in the deck. Nothing is unusual. None of these cards are new, but they are, the cancer is playing with every single trick that the human body has to survive and, and grow in a fairly hostile environment.
So the problem with all this, of course, this is probably the upshot of why cancer treatment is so difficult, is that cancer is not so different from human, normal human tissue, which means that when you get drugs which kill cancer cells, you'll get collateral damage. You will, you will also damage normal cells as well. And it's something which is very, very hard to avoid because cancer is not a foreign invader. It is just a, a manifestation of abnormal timing and magnitude of normal cellular processes. <coughs> so we can't outmuscle cancer, so we need to outthink it. And we are making good progress of that. You know, cancer is really no longer a big black box which we don't understand. We, we now have a, a fairly good idea of what the wiring diagram looks like. This is a wiring diagram from a, a 1975 Triumph Spitfire. Some of you guys will have owned one of those in your time probably. So it's a map which shows you how all the various wires are joined together and how all the various uh, gauges are linked together. And, uh, and we now have a similar map for many cancers. We understand how different parts of the cancer cell are joined together and how it um, reads the environment and acts on those signals. So no longer a black box. Another way to look at that kind of idea is that we're starting to see a road map um, or a, a cityscape for, for many cancers as well, where you know, the, we, can, we can see the main routes which will lead to the city centre, where decisions are made, where, where things happen, and we understand how those, those main routes are joined together. Our vision of this is not perfect, but we're certainly getting a, a really good basic knowledge of what this roadmap is like. So in cancer, the roadmap um, we're referring to are things we call signaling pathways, and these are um, 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 ways in which a cell will interpret information coming from either outside the cell or inside the cell and, and pass that information down a chain of molecules to the nucleus where it will turn on various genes to activate the required functions for cell division or migration or survival. Mutations can occur at any point in these various pathways. And so in some respects, cancer is very vulnerable because there are many, many, many genes involved in these basic pathways. Mutations in any of them can promote cancer development. So this is probably one of the um, more, I was going to say useful, but you know, um, uh, more complex visions of what the cancer cell roadmap looks like. And this is, in fact, probably um, a simplification. It's probably, if you imagine this, the same thing, but in three dimensions, where every single molecule shown in this 2D plan here has another series of links out in, in the third dimension as well. But at least you can get an idea. There are all these connections um, between different parts of the cell um, and numerous cell surface receptors which, which, which understand what's going on in, the, in the, um, the environment outside the cancer cell and they signal through the nucle uh, through, to the nucleus to turn on genes which are involved in promoting cell division and cell migration and cell survival, all those traits that we see in a cancer cell. So the understanding of these pathways is critical to how we will manage cancer in, in the future. <coughs> It doesn't just take one single mutation to lead to a, um, a, a cancer, though. So, for example, this, this is a, the current best guess for um, uh, cancer of the, um, uh, of the colon. And so here we have, say, a, a normal stem cell. So this is a cell which is in a, a, normal, a normal tissue. And um, it will then, in time, if it undergoes certain mutations, develop into an adenoma, so a small benign polyp which will then undergo, undergo some more mutations to become an advanced cancer, then in time that will become an invasive cancer. So th these various states are linked by different pathways. And you need to get mutations in many of these different pathways before you'll get a cancer. A single mutation can take you from a normal stem cell to an adenoma, but you'll need probably around about 10, 12, 13 different mutations in different pathways before that benign adenoma will develop into, into an advanced cancer. And then it's guessed that around about three or four different uh, more pathways will need to be mutated before an advanced tumour will become metastatic. It is one which is able to spread to the distant organs, such as the, the liver and the brain and the lungs. And these mutations can occur at any point 
in these various pathways. But what is, you know, so that's all kind of you know, a bit disturbing, but what is kind of probably the good news is that the timeline isn't as, <coughs> as rapid as we might fear. So rough estimates for colon cancer are the timeline to go from an adenoma or a benign adenoma through to an advanced cancer is between 10 and 20 years. So the time required to accumulate those various 10, 12, 13 different mutations in a single cell is around about 10 to 20 years. So it's quite a slow process before a cancer has all the tricks it needs to become you know, quite invasive and clinically relevant. And then probably another two or three years before that advanced that localised cancer can um, acquire the ability to move and migrate to other organs around the body. So this is, you know, I guess good news. It means that it isn't frighteningly quick, but it also means that it's terribly important that we, we work hard on trying to get early detection. If we can pick up cancers when they are still um, localised, there's still plenty of time to remove them before they um, metastasize and really cause great clinical threat. Another concern, which is um, we're really only starting to get a, 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 a handle on over the last few years, is a thing called uh, tumour heterogeneity. And this is where, as a, a cancer cell divides, it'll, it'll, you know, one cell will become two, two will become four, four will become um, eight, eight will become 16, it'll grow and grow and grow, which is a normal process. But what will happen is that you can get additional mutations occur as the tumour grows. And so the final mutation, uh, the final tumour, may in fact be made up of several different subclones, several different types of cancer in that main tumour bulk. So what looks like a, a single tumour mass is made up, of, can be made up of several different subtypes of cancer. So this is kind of disturbing because it means that treatment can be compromised. So for example, these, what we call you know, these different subtypes, different clones in the tumour mass, they um, may have quite different clinical characteristics, or they might have different response to different drugs. So, for example, you could treat um, the, um, the main tumour mass here and destroy it, but you'll, you'll be left with small amounts of these other clones or, sub or, or subtypes will be left behind. So, you often see this, you know, you, you, you've all heard these clinical stories where someone's tumour has been treated with radiation or drugs and it's shrunk away, and everyone thinks that's, that's great news. As the, tr the treatment has worked, but then the cancer almost always will come back. And that's because, for one reason that, that um, it comes back, is because the treatment can often just kill the main bulk of the tumour, but there are little, these little subclones left behind which are drug resistant, and they, given the chance, will come away and grow again. So, although that's kind of, I think, you know, in some ways depressing, it's also that's the way it is, right? We've always lived with cancer behaving that way clinically. We've always known that there's a risk of the disease will come back. So at least now we're starting to understand why that is. And we start to kind of develop strategies to overcome cancers of this level of complexity. I'll just flick up that one, I think. <coughs> this is just, just quickly just an example of um, development of, of a cancer of the pancreas. And again, just the point I want to make is that the timeline isn't terribly rapid. So to develop from a, a little localised precursor through to something which is kind of quite invasive but still localised to the pancreas. can take around about 12 years. This is one particular example. A further seven years before it becomes big enough and mean enough to metastasise, and then another three more years before those metastases actually get established in different organs. So again, lots of things going on at the, the DNA level, new clones being generated, but the timeline is not as scary as we might first think. So the, the future of cancer treatment is going to be um, personalised medicine. And the idea behind that is that each time a patient presents at a hospital with a tumour, rather than getting the treatment which is standard for the entire population, which is really the way it's done now, is that they'll get um, the DNA of their, of their cancer analysed and, and the treatment will be chosen um, based on their own genetic profile. So at the moment, it's very much based on the, you know, one size fits all, but this is going to change over coming years where it will all be personalised, where each individual patient, each cancer, will, will be treated as being different to the one before and the one after. So based on the, the knowledge of the mutations which have occurred in the, in the DNA, we will then be able to deliver drugs which block the growth of that particular cancer. 
this will probably require various combinations of drugs to, to deal with you know, that issue we talked before of, um, of the tumour heterogeneity. And so by combining various combinations of drugs, um, we should be able to delay um, recurrence of the disease. But no doubt there will need to be repeat treatments again and again. Now I want to give you just a, f a, a few examples um, of um, um, how this is being used in melanoma. And um, some of these slides are, are a little bit unpleasant, so I apologise in advance for that. But um, melanoma is a, is a cancer which has really gone from being the, 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 the bad boy to being the poster child for, for, for kind of personalised or, or rational um, treatment for, for, for cancer. So this slide here shows some of these signaling pathways for melanoma. So this is the outside of the cell here. This is the nucleus un under here. And all these various pathways run, from, as I said before, run from the outside of the cell, um, picking up, sensing the environment around, around the cell and passing information to the nucleus to turn on genes to increase cell um, survival or cell migration or, or cell proliferation. One of the, the key pathways um, in melanoma development is this one here. We call it the, the ras ref pathway. So these, these proteins here pick up a signal from the outside of the cell and they pass a message on down through this chain of proteins to the nucleus where genes are turned on which lead to greater survival and, and, and growth of these cells. So it's an important pathway um, in melanoma. So what frequently happens in melanoma is that the patients get a mutation in this gene here called BRAF. So what the mutation does, it means this pathway becomes active all the time. So rather than, sitting, um, rather than the relying on a signal from outside the cell to say when the cell should divide, when it should move, it becomes independent and rogue. And the cell will, will start to just keep on dividing all the time because this RAF molecule here has a mutation which means it just signals constantly down to the nucleus saying divide, divide, divide. So it's, it's, it's become independent of the signals from outside the cell. So that has been a, a terrible issue and has led to, you know, as you know, you know, very poor outcomes for, for many patients with melanoma. This is an example of someone with, with very advanced metastatic melanoma. You can see the, 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 the spread of the disease around his torso. A, a drug has been developed over the last few years called um, um, Bimur Athenib, and that drug um, is an incredibly powerful drug in that it, it, it blocks the, acti the activity of this BRAF protein and it only hits the, the, the BRAF protein in the tumour cells and not in the normal cells. So it's a very, very specific drug. And that drug um, initially gave phenomenal responses. Here is a patient who the same, the same person who, after 15 weeks on this drug, had what looked like, at least to um, you know, casual, casual observation, complete remission from that disease. Yeah, but you all, of course, know there's a but looming. The, the problem is, of course, that the cancer um, can find ways around this. Because of the, 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 the complexity of all these various signaling pathways, the cancer will find ways around it. And so what you will often find is cancers will within a matter of months, they will start to activate different pathways or they'll get new mutations which will enable them to bypass the effect of, the, of these drugs. So in the case of melanoma, what we often see is that muta more mutations will occur in protein, the next protein down this chain called MEC, another one further down called ERK. These proteins become active. And so, they, so the cell is saying, oh, we don't care that we, can't, we can no longer signal through here. We'll just turn ourselves on further down that chain and still get that increased survival increased growth and, and, and division. And so when this happens, the drug, the, the drug which has been used up here is no longer going to work. So here's that same patient again after 23 weeks and all those tumours have come back again. So again, it's a mixed story. At one level, it's very, very depressing to see the relapse of this patient, but we're clearly doing something right. We actually can go from here to here at least for a period of time. And in the past, that was a, a really a hopeless um, um, ambition. But clearly, we are understanding these pathways well enough so that we can, at least for a while, bring people back to full health. But what do we do now? I mean, obviously, in, in this case, this patient, well, typically they, they will receive um, 
an uh, increase in, in life of around about you know, one to two years, and obviously that is not nearly good enough. So what we can do is we can kind of fight a really rational game here, and we can um, also combat these other proteins as well. So um, you know, recently there have been clinical trials where patients have been given combinations of inhibitors of the RAF and inhibitors of, of MEK, and you find that their survival time you know, really doubles with that combination therapy. So by understanding these pathways and, and developing drugs against the, the, the mutant proteins in these pathways, we can really combat cancer at its own game. And importantly, we can also improve the outcome of, of melanoma patients by enhancing um, the immune system's response against the tumours as well. And so we're seeing gains probably just as, as important as the gains we're seeing with these drugs by using new drugs which enhance how um, um, a um, immune system can recognise the cancer. So really, the story of the melanoma is extremely promising um, and it's a great example of how rational thinking can overcome what was previously a big black box with terrible clinical outcomes. So, back to the, the roadmap. You know, it's, it's in some ways quite daunting. There are many, many different pathways coming into a cell, but increasingly we see that the pathways are limited. Not all of the pathways which a, a cell is using are capable of promoting cancer, and we can actually block these um, you know, in combination and probably lead to very long-lasting or enduring um, clinical responses. So the key will be getting combinations of drugs which block multiple pathways to prevent the cancer's tricks of trying to get around these, these various um, you know, drugs when used as, um, as individual agents. So um, just to, to kind of really close, you know, what progress have we made in, um, in terms of, of numbers? So clearly we've done a lot better in, in um, in x-rays. We've made no progress at all in, in pyjamas. Pyjamas are still as bad as they've always been in hospitals. They have not changed and they probably won't change in the next 50 years. But clearly the technology for um, uh, um, you know, radiation uh, therapy has improved dramatically, is one example. But we look at the, the outcomes for children in particular with cancer and we look at the, the, the survival rates um, over a five year period for children um, with cancer. Over here on the left-hand side, we, we have uh, this is the early 60s or well, mid-60s right through to um, the, um, about 2005 up on that side there. So this is data from um, the, the UK, so probably very similar to data in New Zealand if we, if we had it. And what you can see is for really every single child with cancer type, there's been a, you know, really massive gains in survival for um, uh, these, these kiddies with um, different cancers. So for example, take the, um, the leukemias, um, which I think is in the blue line there, so you see this blue line here. So way back in the 60s, very, very few children survived leukemia, very few. And now it's, it's really, um, in this graph here, we're up in about 80-odd percent, but um, the latest, latest data puts it near 90 percent. So practically every kitty with leukemia now is going to survive that disease, whereas you know, 50 years ago, every kitty with that disease would have died, and, um, would have died from that disease. So incredible gains there, and it's across the board for, for all these various um, childhood cancers. Cancer in children is ironically a little bit easier to treat than adult cancer because it tends to be a simpler disease. It has fewer mutations, not quite so genetically complex, so there are, there are fewer abnormal pathways to deal with. But regardless, this is, a, this is tremendous outcomes for, for children with the disease. The breast cancer rates are... The graph is the other way around now. So this is actually the rate of the, the, um, the, um, the rate of death from cancer. So this is breast cancer, and we see there's been a real downturn since the mid 80s um, in the mortality rates for, for breast cancer, and this is due not so much to um, uh, new drugs, um, although that's been important in the last few years, but mainly been due to earlier detection of the disease through mainly through women's awareness. Um, it's in self-examination, but also through the, um, the screening programs as well. But you can see it's starting to trend down, and we're increasingly we're getting some exciting new drugs which are rationally designed and can be used in a personalised manner. And it's the same story with, with colorectal cancer or, or bowel cancer as well. The, the, um, 
this is, shows the figures for you know, all comers and, and males and females separately, those, th those three different lines. They're all doing the same thing. Males and females are all having the same gains from, um, from new treatments. And you see the rate of mortality is just, just trending downwards as we bring in new drugs um, uh, for the treatment of this disease. And again, there are many, many different compounds in clinical trial at the moment, and I suspect that this curve will just keep on dropping away. In fact, it will probably start to speed up its decline over the coming years. So finally, the future for the disease of cancer. I, th I think um, in years to come, it will become a chronic disease and not a lethal disease. By that I mean it will be a bit more like how we look after diabetes, um, where it is a constant concern, it does always need to be looked after and monitored and treated, but it is normally not life-threatening. I think we'll see the same with cancer as well. So it will be necessary to, 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 when a patient is diagnosed with disease, is to, to take a tumour sample, analyse the mutations which are present in that tumour, identify and develop drug combinations which will hit the various pathways and the various subclones in that cancer, and also apply drugs to improve the immune response against that tumour as well. And then watch the patient very carefully because there's always a very, very high risk that disease will, will return because of that problem of tumour heterogeneity. So it will be necessary to keep a close eye on those patients and we have new techniques um, becoming available at the moment which means that we can look at the genetics of cancer with incredibly powerful uh, sensitivity which we didn't have a few years ago. So there's a chance that we can use simple blood tests to see the development of these subclones very, very early on and treat them before they become clinically relevant. But it's likely to evolve you know, numerous cycles of, of treatment a long period of, of remission followed by relapse and retreatment. I, can, I, I think it will be very hard to find um, you know, cures for advanced disease, but it will certainly get to a point where um, we need not fear the disease like we, we fear it now, where it, is, it will not necessarily result in death, but it will more be a long period of, uh, of treatment. So that's really all I want to say, and so I thank you for your attention, and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Just a simple, where do you place immunotherapy against cancer in this spectrum? Because that's obviously making some gains and some of these quite hard because that could change the game as well. Yeah, I guess I mentioned that, that there is a, you know, the treatments to improve the immune response against uh, cancer. I was really referring to immunotherapy treatment. So, you know, it's, it's obviously a really big player in melanoma, uh, as, as you know, and, um, and the gains there are, uh, as I said, probably greater than we've seen with some of these targeted drugs. Um, I, I think we're going to need to use immunotherapy alongside um, targeted chemotherapy. I don't think um, either alone will be sufficient, but it's certainly a major player in the armatorium and, um, and uh, keep up the good work. Yeah. Can I have a second question? Um, with the, one of the big problems we all face is how are we going to afford to all have all these drugs? And with the big challenge for individualised medicine is, is there enough money in the world to have everyone yeah. on it? Uh, have you ever done through and just calculated how much it actually would cost and we have to change the way drugs are created and, and yeah. costed to be able to deliver on personalised medicine. Yeah, I've, I've never done some, I was, I was thinking about this at this morning actually, I was thinking uh, the cost you know, could get um, you know, incredibly high very, very quickly. And um, But if you know, if you consider the cost of a, of a human life, I mean, there's often, often the, the value of a, a million dollars is often used for the cost of a human life to society. So if you think of the, in those kind of terms, then then you know, treatment costs will be, will be a lot less than that. But, but certainly the costs have to come down dramatically to, to, than from where they are now. You know, at, the, at the moment, um, drugs are so expensive, mainly because of the extreme cost to develop these drugs. So, for example, the average cost to get a, a new cancer drug to market is about a billion dollars US. So the problem with that is that we cannot afford to fund that from our health research dollar. It has to come from the drug companies. They're the only, only groups who have the money to pay a billion dollars for all these various clinical trials in particular, which cost an extreme amount of money. And so if a drug company is going to invest a billion dollars in a drug, they will get their return by charging for that drug at an extremely high amount. And so that's why drugs are really so expensive. So if we can 
and answer to your question, um, um, decrease the cost of drug development, then there won't be quite the same need for the companies to, to elicit such a, an incredible um, return from their investment. So that's you know, going to be difficult. It's going to involve um, um, you know, better preclinical models, but it's never going to be incredibly cheap because you, you always have to go through into clinical trials, and um, clinical trials take time and they cost huge money. So, so yes, there's, there's a challenge there, Graham, um, with getting the cost down, but um, we just have to have a go. Yeah, that's right. So um, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, and um, not such a problem with cervical cancer because they tend to take a brush of the cervix and get multiple cells from there. But certainly, um, melanoma they can miss it. Um, and the, probably the big example there is with prostate cancer, where it's almost like a blind biopsy going into the prostate gland, and, and they may or may not strike that tumour. So yeah, it's, it's a real issue for many, many cancers. So what's um, been developing recently has been um, its method called circulating tumour DNA and, and the idea there is that as these tumours start to, to, to grow, they will also, some of these, the, the tumour cells will also die and their DNA will be spilt and will end up in the bloodstream. And so we now have emerging new techniques which are incredibly sensitive and so that we can, we can detect tumour DNA in the blood. And we know it's tumour DNA because we can we search for mutations, we search for common mutations and we can see that in the blood. So I think in future we'll find that um, that will be an approach which is going to be used a, lo a lot more. With you know, detection, it's, um, it's also it's a difficult game, you know, and in and, and breast cancer in particular we've seen you know, recent controversy around the use of uh, mammography um, for women um, um, uh, who um, are older. And the, the, the concern with, with um, many of the detection techniques is that they can see a, a mass but they have little information on whether that mass is going to be clinically relevant. So for example there's a suggestion that a not a lot but a, perhaps 10% of, of very early breast cancers can spontaneously resolve, uh, resolve themselves. They will, they will not survive, probably being taken out by the immune system. And so there's been a, a concern that if you are very, very aggressive with your, your imaging and just treat everything you see, you can overtreat patients. You can do a lot more surgery than you really have to so, because some of these cancers may not develop. So it's, it's really important that we are able to not only just see tumours through some imaging technique but also get hold of some samples and or the, or the DNA which is built into the blood and see that there's mutations there and make predictions about whether that cancer will be aggressive or not. Yeah, the, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's quite a controversial area, but there's certainly concerns that um, you can sometimes see if you take a put a biopsy into certain cancers and remove that, that needle, you can sometimes see tumor cells moving into that, into that needle wound. And so it's, it is an issue, and um, because again, it's, uh, we, we, I mentioned earlier on, you know, cancer cells will use various cells around them to promote growth, and so when you have a, a wound, uh, um, cells as part of that wound could signal to the tumour cell to, to, to cause increased activation. So generally it's not a concern but occasionally you do see cancers where the, the biopsy itself has um, led to increased progression so to be avoided as much as possible. I, I got in, was mainly concerned about the pyjamas more than natural radiation therapy, so I don't know if I can really answer your question with any, any um, great wisdom, um, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's seen as being a way to control um, and so more palliative than, than curative in many, in many respects. It depends on, on the cancer. The, um, again, the issue becomes you get to a point where you are 
causes such great collateral damage to tissue around the cancer that um, you, you have to stop the treatment. So it's, it's very useful for debulking tumours, particularly prior to surgery, um, and um, it can reduce the recurrence of disease, but and it, it really still sits as being a technique which is more for management and palliation than, than something which is curative. Um, colorectal cancer is a fearful disease, which um, we tell ourselves, I'm actually quite surprised how many just ordinary people will say, well, we're, we're the capital of the world in colorectal cancer, and the South Island in particular, and mm. we all share that history of having lived in the South Island. Um, is there any clue as to why the South Island, the rates, because you must have thought about this a long time, what is actually yeah. your just off the chest um, statement? And uh, Yeah, the... Um You'll be familiar with, uh, familiar with the work of Brian Cox in the Otago University where, where he's done some study where, which suggests that um, uh, the uh, exposure to or the drinking milk, the school, the school milk program was, was protective against um, colorectal cancer. And so it's, it might be, you know, I, I think it's highly likely to be some kind of environmental factor such as, such as um, a, dietary, a dietary factor. But, we don't know what it is. I mean, Brian's theory about school milk could well be right, but um, there could be other theories as well. So it could be, and it's certainly going to be some kind of epigenetic issue. And so it may be simply that exposure to excessive um, um, animal fats, excessive um, proteins from a, a very meaty carbohydrate film diet is causing subtle changes which increases the risk to the disease. It may be related to vitamin D. I hate to say it, but um, you know, vitamin D exposure, um, which is um, produced um, through sun exposure, uh, does decrease the risk of, um, of cancer. So maybe South Islanders have a slightly higher risk because of lower exposure to bright sunlight. So um, we don't know the answers, Graham. I mean, there are other clusters as well. I mean, there's clusters around the Taranaki region as well. But again, it tends to be more the, the farming areas, so perhaps um, you know, meat and veg. But we honestly don't know. Questions? If there's no further questions, then uh, if I can just thank uh, Professor um, Guilford for for um, for your presentation tonight, and certainly the work that is going on with the Centre for Translational Cancer Research, and um, and through the other research work that's been carried out at the University of Otago. So it's. Um, heartening to know that that research is, is um, being carried out and can make a difference to, um, to so the society in which we live. So thank you very much for your presentation. My pleasure. That's good. Um, if I can just uh, then conclude by saying that um, our next lecture, which is next Wednesday night, is Dr Beverly Lawton from our Division of Health Sciences. And uh, her, the, the title of her lecture is um, uh, chasing equity, our women and children are dying. So um, Dr Lawton's uh, research uh, explores um, clinical um, areas and systems um, and um, barriers um, that are um, having a material effect on the harm in this area. So that again will be a very enlightening lecture I'm certain with the work that um, Dr. Lawton is um, carrying out. So, thank you very much for coming. Thank you once again, Pleasure. Barry, for your presentation. <laughs> thank you. You're very welcome to stay and join us now if you'd like to and catch up with uh, Barry. This is nice. my father. I didn't know. So that's back in the 90s or something. So it was just to hear how things and then you would have just